So today we start unit two. Unit one was the first 10 weeks. We did the review last week with the, the cool British guy doing the video. And now we start the four-year journey through uh, the Bible from start to finish. And this today's kind of the whole thing. It's kind of an overview of the whole Bible. So that'll be fun too. So a couple weeks ago, uh, we presented before you a framework to help understand the overarching storyline of the whole Bible, the seven seas of history. And we talked about how that could be an evangelistic tool. And we looked through some verses with that as well. Today, we're going to use it as the overview, and it will be utilized throughout the, the next four years to how to understand the flow of human history as recorded in the Bible. Uh, so we're going to look at Scripture uh, over th this, this whole journey uh, in a chronological manner, uh, focusing on specific topics, specific people not doing that. But again, this, this, this chronology, have any of you ever, uh, as you read through a Bible reading plan, have you ever switched to a chronological Bible reading plan? Have you done that? Uh, those of you who have done it, was it beneficial to see the, the correct order of things? Because uh, it's different uh, when, when you do that. The, the Bible is not like other books in multiple ways. One of those ways is if you read it straight through cover to cover like any other book, it's a little odd because things don't happen in strict chronological order. Uh, so uh, you know, Job is a contemporary of Abraham. But you don't get to Job until several books into your Old Testament, and you've kind of forgot about Abraham by then. Uh, but they lived at the, the, the same chronological period. Uh, Second Samuel and First Chronicles essentially tell of mostly the same events, just from different vantage points. Um, again, you've got the, the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Same basic stories, but from four different perspectives. So there is some chronology uh, it, certainly in the first four books, but then even Deuteronomy is a review of all the history of Genesis through Numbers. Uh, it kind of recounts those events there at the end of uh, Moses' life. So uh, it, as you read through a, a chronological plan, it even will, like as you read through the historical books in the Old Testament, it'll insert Psalms in there with, for when they were written. You know, because some Psalms are written in response to specific events. Like uh, you know, Psalm 51, after uh, the prophet Nathan confronts King David with his sin with Bathsheba, uh, and he repents of his sin, well, he writes Psalm 51 at that point. So you read Psalm 51 after you read 2 Samuel 11 and 12, uh, and that confrontation. So it helps you see all, all those things. And, and just on a much larger scale, that's what we're doing through this curriculum, is it presents the whole thing in chronological uh, order. So today's kind of a whirlwind through the Bible, this big picture framework for understanding the history of the universe. Um, and as we look at these, these points in biblical history, one of the things that we're going to examine, uh, at least we'll talk about a little bit at the end, and that's one of the things for you to do in, in your homework, that second sheet of your handout. So we'll talk through, like, here's how the Bible views these seven C's of human history, and then how a secular world views them. They're set in contrast to one another so that you can see just how different the Christians think than the world thinks in general and how they explain some things away. Uh, so you know, we'll, we'll walk through, obviously, the biblical side. You can compare them and contrast them with the, the secular histories as well. So our, our goal today is really simple, just to introduce the framework and we'll be developing these themes over the course of the next few years. Uh, so we're not going to answer all the questions about the entire Bible today. I, I mean, I know you had that expectation and that I, you knew I could pull that off. But we're not going to do that today um, because we're going to spend a lot of time in these over the course of the next number of years. So let's start with creation. This is where everything begins. Genesis 1 describes how God created not just the earth, but the entire universe. So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, Genesis 1.31, and God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. 
So God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth is a figure of speech. It's kind of a metaphorical sort of phrase that means the universe. It's how we would say the whole nine yards, which actually comes out of World War II. Or we would say high and low, from head to toe. It describes the totality of something. So when God creates the heavens and the earth, he creates all of it. it. It's everything in its entirety. And all of it, verse 31, is very good. It's all good. It's functioning according to its design. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It is exactly as God intended it to be. And when you take a plain reading of Genesis 1, what you discover is God created the universe over a period of six 24-hour days and rested on the seventh. Um, and to come to any other view than that, you have to alter a plain, common-sense reading of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, you have to add a bunch of other stuff in to turn it, and, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that in a little bit. But that's how you, that's the only way to get to a view other than six 24-hour periods of time. Turn to Genesis 5. Genesis 5 is a chapter of genealogies. Not everybody's favorite when they read through the Bible. So-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so and all of that. Um, those are the ones that you're kind of glad that's on your Bible reading day because you can skim and not feel guilty about it. It's those. So look for a second at those genealogies and tell me what you notice about them. Just basic stuff that you notice about those lists. They died. Yep. Yep. And yeah, the, the, the rate of death, pretty consistent over human history. They, they, yes, those are big numbers, right? Yeah, they live long lives. What else? What? They had sons and daughters. Yep. What else? Yeah. Yeah, they do get shorter. Yes, you've got a couple of you know, anomalies in there. They're a little bit longer, but they do eventually get shorter to where God eventually puts a limit on, on lifespan uh, later in Scripture. What else do you see? Enoch, yeah, Enoch's there, walk with God, and then he was not. Yeah. He's the first one who does not die. Correct. Yep. What else? They had babies at very old age. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be weird to have a baby like 700? <laughs> Man. That's just, yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. Goodness gracious. Um, so notice that there are, there are numbers listed. There are ages, specific ages listed. They have the dates, essentially, of the birth of the child and the age of the father and how long the father lived after the birth of that child in particular. Here's why this is important. The list begins with Adam in Genesis 5, makes its way to Noah and his sons. So if you were to sit down with a calculator you could determine some things because of those ages that are listed. The time between Adam and Noah can be determined by looking at these genealogies. So those, those lists of births and deaths actually are important uh, because they tell us how much time has gone by. You can combine them with other genealogies. You can then arrive at the date of Abraham. Abraham is 2,000 years after Adam. So from Genesis 1 through Genesis 11, 2,000 years of human history has gone by. So there, there's a lot packed in there, isn't there? Then between Genesis 12, where we're introduced to Abraham, Abram at that point, to Christ is another 2,000 years, according to the genealogies that open up Matthew and Luke. And we know we're a couple thousand years now after Christ so that helps us to see, when did all this start? About 6,000 years ago. So how old is the earth? It's about 6,000 years old. So whenever you hear someone spout off X number of billions of years, it's utter nonsense. It's guesswork and nothing more. That's all that is. So the, a timeline of history from a biblical perspective, starts at around 4,000 BC. 
So that's creation. It's where everything begins. And now I, I throw this stuff out to you um, because we want to let the Bible say what it says. We don't want to edit it. We don't want to rewrite it. We let it say what it says. So uh, some of these lessons, specifically here in the next uh, number of weeks in this unit in particular, are going to be very challenging to some of you uh, because you have not held a biblical view of the age of the universe uh, or creation. Uh, you've, you've held other views that are taught absolutely everywhere else other than the church and all this other stuff that's added into it. But here's, here's what you need to know when we start talking about you know, creationism and the different, even the different views of creationism, whether it's young earth, old earth, theistic evolution, all those different things. The view that you land on regarding age of the universe, how everything began, your view has nothing at all to do with evidence. Nothing. Because everybody's looking at the same evidence. Like we don't have a different set of evidence than everybody else does. We're looking at the same thing. It's just the interpretation of said evidence. That's the difference. The view that you land on has nothing to do with science. None whatsoever. Because it's all guesswork. It's not actual science. The view that you land on has everything to do with how you read your Bible. That's it. Which is why we spent the first unit, first 10 weeks, talking about what is your Bible and how do you read it? It comes down to how you read your Bible. If Genesis 1 through 11 is history, real simple. You read it, it's history, you let it say what it says. God created the earth in six 24-hour periods of time. We don't redefine the word day, which is just goofy that people do that. And you come to this conclusion. This is the age of the universe. This is how it works because Genesis 1 to 11 is literal. To get to a view other than that, you have to say that Genesis 1 to 11 is something else. You have to say it's not history. You have to say it's not literal. And when you do that, you have set a stick of dynamite on the foundation of your faith and it blows up everything else. You think it might be helpful to go, oh yeah, well that lines up better with your current scientific evidence or current how people are viewing things right now, worldview, whatever it might be. But if you say, well, Genesis 1 isn't literal. Well, when does it become literal? At what point? At what point can we start to trust that the Bible means what it says? If we can't trust Genesis 1, when can we start? Do we start at Genesis 3? At the fall with Satan? Well, if you say that Genesis 1 isn't literal, then, then Genesis 3 isn't either. So Adam wasn't an historical person. Satan isn't real. He's just a metaphor for evil. So the sin that comes into humanity, guess what? It's not real. It is metaphorical. So you're not really a sinner in Adam. It's what Romans chapter 5 explicitly says, by the way, which is not uh, metaphorical or poetry. <laughs> None of that is true for you. So what do you need salvation for? You're not really a sinner. You're a mistaker. You just have misordered priorities. That's it. And you just need to go on a little retreat somewhere and have some new priorities in order in your journal. And bada boom, bada bing, you're saved. This is the, so this is the kind of stuff that happens. So if it's not Genesis 3, is it Genesis 6 with the flood? Was there really a global flood? Like Genesis 6 says there was. Well, if that's not literal, well, it's probably just a, a local flood that um, you know, looked global to them because they, they didn't know any different and all they could see was water. So obviously it's, it's global to them. Well, then you've undermined God's justice and judgment on sin and the fact that God killed everyone on planet earth for their sin, except for one family. Well, it's certainly easier just to ignore that, isn't it? And undermine it. So when then is it literal? Chapter 12, when we get to Abraham? Can we start trusting the Bible in Genesis 12? Or do we have to continue what we've started with Genesis 1 to 11 and apply it to everything? 
And now it's all metaphorical. We can, we can just make it say what we want it to say because it sounds better and it makes us fit in better and be cool and hip with our neighbors. And herein lies the problem with current American Christianity. That's it right there. We've decided the Bible doesn't say what it says. It says what we want it to say. Yes, sir. Nothing? <laughs> you stop. <laughs> we know where you're going to say it. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it does. This is also the guy who on most Sundays when I come out after preaching, he goes, hey, that was adequate. <laughs> yes. What I don't understand was the reason I asked, stop it. I want to know. Yeah. What's wrong with the James Bible? Because it really lays it out very clearly. Sure. But over the subsequent translation of the Bible, Firmament, yeah. What's wrong with the word firmament? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty important. Yeah. That's yeah. an important word that over and over and over again. Quoting me back to me. I just, Sly. I just, my, my question is, <laughs> yeah. is if they'll take words out because they don't want us to know them, mm -hmm. if they'll take as a human, if they take words like firmament out of our life and, and put in sky above, Mm -hmm. Expand. Doesn't mean anything closer. Mm -hmm. What else do they do? Sure. I just fell in love. <laughs> you have a you have a new best friend. Did we just become best friends? Uh, so here here's why the contemporary translations hit a little bit differently than the King James does. One, it's it's the language. Part of it's just a language issue. It's dated language. Uh, can people understand? Uh, all of that, it's an assumption that people today are dumb and we need to dumb it down. That's part of it. That's, that's driving it. That's a, that's a real thing. From a scholarly perspective, uh, the difference between a King James and new ones today, because new ones today, is it, is it 13 verses, 12 or 13 verses that the King James has that the contemporary ones do not have? Why is that? Have the new ones taken things out? No, from a scholarly perspective, because when King James authorized the Bible in 1611, the manuscripts that were in existence at the time were all they had. That was it. Well, post-1611, because uh, when it says authorized version, it's only, it's, that's King James authorized, not like God authorized, or it's, it's King James. Um, he was a great guy. We appreciate him. So today, we have discovered since 1611 manuscripts that are much older than the ones that were in existence in 1611. The older manuscripts do not have those verses, and they do not have some of those words. Permanent, it's not one of those, it's just retranslated. Uh, but so those things weren't there in the older ones. So what does that mean? That means that over time, they have been inserted by well-meaning scribes and translators, not out of a, a desire to manipulate the text or deceive people, none of those kinds of things. But they found older ones, those are missing, or you know, they're marginal notes that over time made their way into the text. So the older the manuscript typically means better and more accurate. So the new ones today are not based on the same Greek and Hebrew manuscripts as the King James. They're based on the older ones, which is why they don't have those same things in them. So there's nothing wrong with the King James whatsoever. Uh, it's a great translation. It's quite literal. It's a very good one. Um, so are some of the contemporary ones that are literal. The, the ones that aren't literal, you can just dismiss those um, because they're some translation team just saying it like they want it to sound, which is how you get some of the words that aren't coming across like they used to come across and, and things like that. So, so that, that's how those things happen um, over, over time. It, it's the field of biblical criticism. And if you're like super nerd, it's extremely fascinating uh, to know how did we get the Bibles that we have today? How can we know it's trustworthy and accurate? Uh, it's, it's through all that. So uh, we, we do have six other C's to go through. So we won't, we won't get into much to Richard's 
sadness, we won't talk for the next 30 minutes on King James, though we would like to. Oh, I know, and, and we have, and, uh, and that's fine. Good for you, uh, but we're not going to do it now. Out of respect for you, I will. Thank you. You're very kind, very respectful. The second C, corruption. God created a perfect universe. It was free of death, free of disease, free of pain, free of suffering, free of sin. And that changed quite quickly. Chapter 3, verse 6. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So does the Bible give a time reference between the creation of man and its fall into sin? No, there is no direct indication of this many years have gone by between Adam and then the, the fall in Genesis 3. Most scholars suggest that sin entered the world pretty quickly after the close of creation week. So after that, that week is over, possibly within a week or so, Genesis 3 happens. Because Genesis 2 is just a retelling of the creation event zeroed in on the creation of mankind. And we'll discuss in, in, in other lessons reasons for some of this. Uh, so the, the second seed, corruption, is very close to the original creation. It would seem as if humanity didn't make it very long in paradise before we blew it, which should surprise no one in the room that it, it didn't take long at all. So... Um, this act of treason against God in, in the Garden of Eden impacted not only Adam and Eve, according to Romans 8, it broke the universe. Sin is much more powerful and comprehensive than we would give it credit for, which is why then on your second sheet, it would say that corruption is about the same age, 4000 BC, because of that. So sin increases. Mankind finds multiple ways to deny God's authority Wickedness increases so much that God declares he is sorry that he created mankind and plans to wipe them out, which leads to the third C, catastrophe. It's about 2350 BC, uh, 1600 and something years after Adam's creation. So we've bumped forward pretty significantly in our timeline. God chose to judge mankind with a global flood that would destroy all creatures, including mankind. Um, again, there are those today who claim the flood didn't cover the entire earth, that it's just local and all that. But, but I, I'll be honest with you, and we'll, we'll get into this in, in subsequent lessons. Um, the impact of a global flood geologically is the answer to most issues regarding creation versus evolution. Uh, it, it answers most of the questions as to how, did we, how do we have this kind of evidence that looks like it's this. The impact of a global flood solves a lot of those dilemmas. Uh, so Genesis 7, a couple of passages there of Noah's life. The rain comes upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Um, again, it, it never says it, it comes upon Canaan or th this region or that region. It's the earth, so it seems to be quite global. Uh, you look at rock layers, billions of dead things, all of that that were buried in the flood. Um, you know, how these rock layers extend across continents can be explained by a global event. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk eventually in later lessons, how did all the animals fit on the ark? We'll talk about that. That's fun. Um, how the flood reshaped the earth, because it absolutely did and would have, um, and other, other things as well. But we do not forget that the ark is a symbol of judgment against the wickedness of mankind, God's hatred of sin. And the rock layers are evidence of God's hatred of sin because he killed everything because of their sin. But we dare not forget that in the midst of his judgment on sin, God in his mercy saved the human race through Noah and his family, a picture of the gospel to come. In his wrath on sin, God's mercy saves. Next C is confusion. Uh, the flood ended a bit more than a year after it began. 
These eight survivors uh, were commanded to multiply and fill the earth, just as he had commanded Adam and Eve to do so. But they did not. They refused. They stayed in one local area. Therefore, there's now the event called Babel in Genesis 11, where God comes down in their wickedness, in their deceit, in their disobedience to do what God has told them to do. God confuses their languages and disperses them over the face of the earth. Again, another example of God's judgment passed on to humanity. And we have a record of the families that were alive in, at this event uh, in Genesis 10. Genesis 10 is often referred to as the table of nations. Uh, these are the, the families that got spread over the course of the earth. Well, tucked into Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, is a clue that helps us determine the timing of the Tower of Babel. Peleg was born and was given the name because in his days the earth was divided. Spread out, divided at the Tower of Babel. So we can determine that the events at Babel happened around 2240 BC. So we can date the Tower of Babel. And this is a, quite an important event in human history because it helps us explain the world that we live in. People spread across the globe. Different people groups are formed. They have different physical characteristics over time. And what we typically refer to as different races really aren't that. They're all members of the human race, all descended from Adam through Noah. This explains the, the, the main language families we have in the world today is they all started from one in Genesis 11 and were split into several. So what's interesting when you think through the seven seas, which is certainly punny uh, that they did that, seven seas uh, of human history, and they did that on purpose, by the way. Um, the first four of the seven, we're not even out of Genesis 11 yet because there's so much packed into those chapters, which is why it is detrimental to say, ah, they're poetic and we don't understand them as literal history uh, because we've undermined uh, the absolute foundation of the Bible and of the faith. Because uh, again, if you can't trust Genesis 1 to 11, when can we trust it? Uh, so there are three more quick C's that we'll look at. But the next one is Christ. So there's quite a gap from Genesis 11 to Matthew 1. Got a lot going on there. So could you think of some other major points throughout that time period between Genesis 11 and uh, Matthew 1 that maybe if you wanted to expand the seven seas, which you can't because that ruins the pun, um, what are some other ones we could add in there? Hebrew nation, what was yours? Yeah. No, I, I have some that start with C, but that's neither here nor there. Because if you're going to be alliterative, then do it, you know, embrace it. So what else, what else is in Old Testament history? Capitalism. <laughs> that might come a little bit later. More recent history. So, captivity. Yeah, there you go. It even starts with C. Yes, I knew I liked you. Yeah, the Babylonian captivity. Certainly in there. Anything else you can think of off the top of your head? Covenants. Oh, man, we're just, we're doing it. Crossing the Red Sea, man. man, I love you guys. You're the best, man. Because I'm so proud right now. Ah, see, my my constant preaching with alliterative outlines is finally taking its toll. I've worn you down to the point that this is how you think. Hashtag nailed it. What? Commandments. Yes. I heard there was another one that <laughs> English, please. Uh... <laughs> capturing, yes, capturing the Holy Land. Man, you guys are good. Um, I, I had some. The covenant with Abraham starts in 12. The commandments given to Moses. Camping in the wilderness. Oh, come on. Come on. We can make it work, it fits. I mean, technically, they tabernacled according to the Hebrew, but it's, it's camping. 
Uh, it's, it's the same thing. It's a evidence of those word changes over time. We don't go tabernacling on the weekend. We go camping. <laughs> same thing. Conquering the promised land. Uh, the crowns for the times of the kingdoms. Um, captivity under Assyria and Babylon. So, you know, again, if we got creative, we could go on. Uh, but let's talk about Christ. He's the most important anyway. So this is the fifth C, God's entrance into the world in the flesh. The incarnation of Christ um, Matthew chapter one, verse 21, and she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So Adam brought sin into the world. Jesus came to the earth to save his people from their sins. Read Romans 5. And look at the contrast of in Adam versus in Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these promises, beginning in Genesis 3.15, the stomping the head of the serpent. So uh, the fulfill fulfillment of all of that, about 2,000 years ago, there's some debate on the exact date of the birth of Christ. By today's calendar, it's likely around 5 BC. So he didn't. He wasn't born at zero. They weren't tracking it. Uh, all this stuff, those calendars have been added after time. He wasn't born on December 25th, the year zero. Uh, it was likely around October. I like to think October 2nd. That's a good day to be born. Uh, around 5 BC-ish. And again, you can, you can look that up all you want, whatever. Uh, let's talk about the cross, the next one. Um, again, all of, all of the life of Christ culminates at the cross of Jesus Christ. He's lived a sinless life. He now takes uh, our punishment for our sin onto himself, takes God's wrath against sin onto himself as our substitute and saves those who call in his name. Always was part of God's redemptive plan throughout the history revealed in the Bible. First Corinthians 15, Paul refers to Christ as the last Adam. First Adam brought sin, the last Adam brings life. The last one, consummation. Now, this one technically isn't an historical event because it hasn't happened yet. But here's what we know about God. It's as if it's already happened because he has never failed on any promise that he has ever made. So we know with certainty that Christ will return to the earth reverse the effects of the curse of sin as he will create a new heavens and a new earth where we will dwell for all of eternity. And it will happen as exactly the Bible describes. And again, Christians hold different views on the end times and that's fine. We can talk about those once we get to it. What a gracious God. As we start with creation and we see all that has gone down over the course of human history, what a gracious God who would send a savior to redeem his people from a curse that we brought onto ourselves and then grant to us eternal life with him in heaven. And I hope that that would bring you a sense of joy and expectation for God's working in the world. That is the history of the universe in a nutshell. Uh, so uh, as you do your homework, one of the things I want you to do, look at that chart that you have and compare this is how the Bible lays this out. This is how secular thinking lays it out and see the difference between the two because they are quite profound. One, two, three, go team.